morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Tuesday. I am excited this morning. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles 25, and I'm going to be talking about um, this morning. Uh, you are responsible for doing things your way, but God is responsible for when you do it his way. Um, that word responsible uh, means um, when we're thinking about in terms of responsibility, um, it goes right in line with accountability. It goes right in line with um, the actions that come from it. Um, you're responsible. You're held accountable. Um, you know, and and it when you think about that statement, um, a lot of times we hear it and it's kind of like, yeah, I'll just do things uh, God's way. But I want you to think about this as I talk about Second Chronicles 25 this morning is that many people uh, say that they're going to do things uh, God's way. But uh, most of the time, uh, we end up doing it our way. And so I want you to think about that this morning is that our goal is to do things um, God's way. Our goal is to try not to do things our way because we want God to be responsible for um, what we do. We want God to be involved in what we do. Uh, we want God to be involved in what we do and responsible um, for the outcome of what we do. And when we start doing it our way, uh, we're responsible for that outcome. And then we're held accountable for it as well. And so uh, we're going to be, you guys pray for me this morning. It has been a busy weekend and I have an extremely busy week and then weekend, and then going into next week, uh, things have definitely picked up with my job. And so uh, it's getting super busy. And so you guys pray for me this morning as I do this video. Uh, I'm excited about the lesson this morning. I definitely think it's going to be good. And uh, I think it's going to be good because often, again, when I, when I teach the scripture, I try to teach it in a way that I look at myself um, and what God is trying to say to me. And so I pray this morning that as uh, we get into Second Chronicles 25 that you do the same, that you look and see um, how it applies to you. And so let's get with it. Second Chronicles 25. Uh, we'll start with verses one and two. And it says, my Amaziah, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned and in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Johadan from Jerusalem and Amaziah did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, but not wholeheartedly. And so I want to stop right there. And so it says that, um, I don't know why my voice all of a sudden is trying to go out, but um, it says that Amaziah, uh, son of Joash, so he's the son of Joash, that he kind of continued in general um, godly reign. But the latter part of verse two says, uh, but he did not do it wholeheartedly. That word actually means he did not do it loyally. And so when we look at this, um, if we were to compare Amaziah to his father, Joash, uh, he did well. He did well. He, um, in comparison to Joash, uh, he was good. But when we look at him in comparison to David, uh, he didn't do well because David was the Bible. Excuse me. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And so in comparison to David, he didn't do well. But if we are to compare him to his father, then we're going to see that he was a little better than his father, that he and I say this. Um, you can find this in Second Kings 14, one through four. Uh, Amaziah uh, tried to do general uh, practices to, to do things God's way. And so he upheld a lot of policies, um, again, at Second Kings 14. But then when you continue to look at it, some of the policies he did not uphold, which was that he allowed them to burn incense um, in high places. And so again, that was a, a form of idol worship and he let that go on. But there were other things that when you look at like his dad, he did better. Uh, one of the things I want to start off by saying is that um, 
we are not to compare ourselves to other men. Our standard, and, and this is just point number one, our standard is God. Our standard is not men. If we were to look at men, then we could say, hey, I'm better than so-and-so. Hey, I'm better than this person. Hey, uh, I'm not as bad as this person. Uh, if you were to look at that comparison, then you could easily get in self-righteousness and you could easily think like you're better than everyone else. I want to challenge you this morning is not to put your standard according to men men, but let your standard be God. And so when we look at God, um, are you walking as Christ walked when he was in the earth? Are you um, pleasing in the father's sight? And so when we look at Amaziah, one of the things that stands out to me is that Amaziah, um, in comparison to his father, um, okay, so he was, he was a little better than his father. If we were to compare him to uh, David, then he wasn't that great because the Bible says David was a man after his own heart. Hey, hi Marcus, what's up? Good morning, Lillianne. Thank you guys for jumping on this morning. Uh, so again, if we were to compare him to the standard of David, he didn't do well. If we were comparing him to the standard of Christ, he didn't do well. And so again, point number one is that our standard to judge our lives should be the standard of Christ and not man. Many times when we're looking at standards for our life, we judge ourselves according to men. And so we say like, hey, uh, Amaziah could have said, hey, I'm better than my father, Joash. But that's not the standard that he should have had. Our standard for judging our lives our standard for our lives, period, is Christ, not other mere men. And so don't get any self-righteous satisfaction where it's like, I'm better than so-and-so. I'm, I'm not as bad as, as Johnny. No, the standard for our lives is Christ. And so again, in verse one and two, it talks about that Amaziah wasn't that bad. Um, he followed in the ways of the Lord, but his heart was not loyal. That's a big thing. So it, to me, it's great that you followed in the ways of the Lord, but your heart should have followed as well. Good morning, Tib. Good morning, Valerie. Thank you guys for jumping on. So again, point number one is that our standard for our lives is Christ. Our standard is not other mere men. Uh, men you cannot, you cannot judge your life by saying, hey, I'm better than my best friend. I'm better than so-and-so. She's walking in the flesh. Our standard for our lives is Christ. It's not men. Let's keep going. Verses three and four. It says, when Amaziah was well established as king, he executed the officials who had assassinated his father. His father was Joash. However, he did not kill the children of the assassins, for he obeyed the command of the Lord as written by Moses in the book of the law. Parents must not put to death for the sins of their uh, children, nor children be be put to death for the sins of their parents. Those deserving to die must be put to death for their own crimes. Okay, so I'll stop here. So Amaziah, as we look in the text, um, again, I said he wasn't as bad as his father, but the standard we're going to judge his life is really Christ, not his father and not other men, not other kings. I'm not going to throw him in there with other kings. What I'm going to say is his standard for judging his life is really Christ. So now we see in verses three and four, the Bible had already said that he wasn't that bad. He followed in God's way, but his heart was not right. His heart was not loyal. It was not wholeheartedly. We jump to verses three and four, and here it is. Amaziah is following in obeying the law. And so, okay, some people killed his father. He went back and killed those adults, but he did not kill the children. Okay. So he followed the law of Moses, ancient practice in that day. So if we were to look at what they were doing back in the day is that in, in tradition of, of the land, then he, he, he could have killed the, the, the people, the adults that killed him, his father, and then he could have killed the children. Why the Bible makes note of this is because it's telling you that he did not follow the way of the world or the way of tradition or the way of the land. He followed God's ways, which was, okay, you killed the, the adults that killed your father, but you spared the children. So again, we see Amaziah is following in godly ways, but the Bible has already warned us that his heart is not loyal and his heart is not holy. Heartedly, I want to pause and say this morning is God looks at your heart. God is not uh, drawn in looking at your outer appearance. So he not caught up in my lip gloss. He not caught up in my hair and my fancy glasses. What God is looking at this morning is my heart for, for the Bible says that, 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 uh, um, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, uh, the mouth speaks. Uh, so there are the issues of life flow out of your heart. And so what I'm saying this morning is God is checking our heart. He's looking at our heart to make sure our heart is right before him. And so just because he's doing a few good deeds, um, the Bible had already told us in verse two that his heart was not loyal. So let's keep going. 
verses five through eight. It says, then Amaziah organized the army, assigning generals and captains for all of Judah and Benjamin. He took a census and found that he had three, 300,000 troops, 20 years old, and he trained that were all trained using spears and shield. He also paid about 7,500 pounds of silver to hire 100,000 experienced fighting men. Uh, but a man of God came to him and said, Your Majesty, do not hire the troops from Israel, for the Lord is not with Israel. He will not help those people of Ephraim. If you let them go with your troops in the battle, you will de be defeated by your enemy. No matter how well you fight, God will be God will overthrow you, for he has the power to help you. I want you guys to listen to this. For God has the power to help you, or he has the power to trip you up. All right, I want to stop right there. So this is going to be really the senses of what I'm teaching this morning is that right now in verses five through eight, again, remember verse two says that Amaziah's heart was not loyal, that he has some issues in his heart. Um, he didn't serve the Lord wholeheartedly. And we start to see that right here uh, again. And when we read verses three and four, he obeyed the law of Moses. He killed the, he killed the people who killed his father, but he didn't kill their children. The Bible gives him some kudos for that. But now when we read verses, is five through eight. I want you to see this for your own life because I had to look at this for my own life. Now we see where Amaziah has a choice. He's, he, he goes, he's getting ready to go fight uh, the Edomites. And what he does is he decides, you know what, I'm king. And the way I want to go fight is uh, 300,000 men is not enough. Even though they have been trained, the Bible says with spears and, and, and shields, he, he decides that that's not enough. When I go fight these people, uh, I want 400,000 men. And so he hires, uh, he uses 7,500 pounds and he decides to hire another 100,000 uh, uh, troops or fighting men, experienced men to come from Israel. Okay, that's him doing it in his own way. Uh, the thing about, I said this in the title of the video, is that when you do things your way, you're responsible for it. But when God does things his way, God is responsible for all of it. So our job job is really to do it God's way. What we're seeing right here with Amaziah is he's deciding this is the way I want to go to war. And I don't want to go with just 300,000 people. I want to go with another 100,000. And so he, he wanted to go to war with 400,000 people. The issue with that is the, the man of God comes and says, hey, uh, you don't you hire them 100,000 people. Um, you shouldn't do that because God is not with uh, Israel and, 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 and do not do that because it's not pleasing in God's sight. That's basically what the prophet said as he came to Amaziah. I want you to put yourself in this situation because all of us is in this place at some point or another. We try to do it our way with our skill, with our knowledge, with what we think we should do, with our hustle, with our street sense, whatever your way of doing things. It's easy for you just to do that. What we see here with Amaziah is that God interrupts what he's trying to do and says, hey, that's not my will. That's not the way I want to do it. And so regardless of what you think is right, it is not pleasing in my sight. And Messiah now has a choice. He can continue to do it his way or he can do it the way of the Lord. We all have a choice when we are faced with situations, when we are faced with financial situations, when we are faced with job issues, relationship issues, whatever issues you are faced with, you still have a choice. You can do it your way or you can do it God's way. And sometimes your way and God's way lines up, but sometimes your way and God's way does not line up. What am I saying this morning is that it is very important that in our life that we are seeking the Father. One of the things you often hear me say is that I partner with Holy Spirit. Why? Because that's the reason God gave him to us. Why do you have Holy Spirit if you're not going to invite him in to anything? You're just going to do everything your way. The goal for us is that because God left his spirit here on the earth with us and his spirit is on the inside of us is that when it's rough, when we are going through things, when we are walking through life, we are to partner with Holy Spirit and we are to say, okay, Holy Spirit, what, what should I be doing? Do you want me to take this job? Do you want me to be in this relationship? relationship? Do you want me to go to this church? Do you want me to go here? It is not our job once we become believers just to do things our way. And I'm not going to 
say you're going to always hit the bullseye, but you should be striving to be partnering with Holy Spirit and striving to invite him in and to be led by him. Uh, when we do things our way, often it gets us in trouble. I can attest to this. You can attest to this. When we when we are stubborn, when we are like bullheaded, um, a lot of leaders struggle with this. Uh, we are quick to make decisions, quick to just, I just know what to do. Um, but when we don't invite God in, we become responsible for the actions and the outcomes that are going to come from us doing things our way. Let's keep going. And verse nine says, and Amaziah asked the man of God. So instead of just obeying, he's going to pose a question. But what about all the silver I paid to hire this army? And the man of God replied, uh, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. Um, and so, okay, I, I want to stop real quick right there because I want you to see something. So verse 9 and 10, Amaziah, so he could have just obeyed, um, but he decided to pose a question to the prophet. He says, what about all the money I just gave up, the 7500 I just paid to have this 100000 uh, uh troops to come and to do it my way? What about that? So basically what Amaziah is concerned about is he's concerned about that paper. He's concerned about that green, that, that the narrow that he has paid to, to, to hire these 100,000 troops to come in. He's not so much concerned about doing it God's way as he is like, hey, I'll obey, but is, is God going to give me back my 7,500 that I paid? My question is, uh, why are you concerned about the money when you already was doing it your own way? God don't have to give you nothing back because at the end of the day, you hired those 100,000 troops. He don't have to give you no money, but he's gracious and he can, but he doesn't have to because really what you was doing was in your, your own self, your own flesh. You was doing you. And often I see people on Facebook and everywhere else, they're like, I'm doing me, baby. Do you, boo, whatever. People are doing it. What, what I want to say is that's cute and funny, but that's not the way as a believer, you know, that we should live not in perfection. I'm not saying legalism. I'm, I'm not saying religion. What I'm saying is when you're in relationship with someone, you, uh, you consult them before you just jump and start doing stuff because we are in relationship with Jesus Christ. We are not to just do us. We are not to just post on Facebook. I'm doing me, baby. Um, you're doing you with Holy Spirit. You're doing you with the Father. You're doing you with seeking the Father because you want God to be pleased um, as you walk this walk out. You understand that the reason you were created, find this in, I, I believe, Isaiah 43 and 7, was to bring glory to the Father. You weren't created to do you, boo. You weren't created to just do your own thing. You weren't created to just be out there wilding out, and I just want to do me, and I don't care about everybody else. Good morning, uh, Tanya. Kenya. Thank you guys for jumping on. Uh, you weren't created to just do whatever you want. You were created, the Bible says, to bring glory and honor to the Father. And so when you're out there writing the books, when you're out there working on that job, your job is to invite Holy Spirit in and to make sure you are in line with what God's plan and will is for creating you. You did not create yourself. Whoever created you is responsible for it. So if you look at a book, the books that I have written, I've created them. I am responsible for the contents in that book. God created you. He's responsible for you. And so we are to seek the Father in our everyday life and not just do us. All right, let's keep going. So, oh, point number two I put is God is after your obedience. Everything else is in his hands. So when we look at this situation with Amaziah, um, God could have easily given him the money back. But God is concerned about our obedience. He's concerned about our heart. Everything else you're worried about is in his hands. He just wants your obedience. And so when he tells you not to do something, he wants your obedience. No matter how much your flesh wants it, when he say, don't get that chili dog, he means don't get it. And I don't care if every part of your flesh wants it. It is better to be obedient to whatever God is saying than to do you, boo. Do your own thing is what I'm saying. Again, you are responsible when you start doing things your way. So don't be throwing a little pity pat because now you're bothered that all this stuff is going wrong. No, you're responsible. Now God can show up and grace and mercy can be there. But when you start doing things yourself, um, that's why it's very important in this season of my life, as I just turned 37, it is important for me to partner with Holy Spirit and say, okay, I am 37. What do you want me to be doing? 
Um, so I, I don't have 150 more years. It's like, what do you want me to do in the earth? What are you saying for me to do right now? Because maybe I've missed it. Maybe what I thought I wanted to do is not what you want me to do. And I'm not so prideful that I won't humble Angela and say, okay, maybe I missed it. Holy Spirit, what are you saying for me to do? And I won't just stay somewhere because I just want to stay there. I am always consulting the Father as to what is your will for my life. I don't want to do things my way because every time, listen to me, every time I do it my way, I jack it up. I don't know about you. Maybe you do it right when you do you. When I do Angela, I jack it up all the time, which is why now at 37, it's important for me to seek the father and say, do you want me to write a book? Do you not want me to do it? Do you want me to take this position? Do you not want me to do it? And we see with Amaziah, he has a choice. All right. It says the man of God replied, the Lord is able to give you much more than the money, basically. So Amaziah discharged the higher troops, sent them back to Ephraim. The, this made them very angry with Judah and they returned home in great rage. Then Amaziah summoned his courage, led his army to the Valley of Salt, where they killed 10,000 Edomite troops from Seir. They captured another 10,000 and took them to the top of the cliff and threw them off, dishing them to pieces in the rocks below. Meanwhile, the higher troops that Amaziah has sent home, so the people that he brought in, it was his own thing, he had raided several towns of Judah, Samaria, and Behoron. They killed 3,000 people and carried off great quantities of plunder. I want to stop right there. All right, so here we go in the text. Amaziah decides to be obedient to the prophet, even though he already asked. So what was in his heart? Was he asked about the money? He was more concerned about the money than he was about obeying God, but let's give him some credit. He went ahead and he obeyed God. The Bible says that when he turned the troops away, they were severely angry. Uh, why were they angry? Because he hired them. God didn't hire them. He hired them, but then God told him to send them home because that was his own co concoction. He created that. God didn't create it. So God said, go ahead, send that home. That's not what I created. You conjured that up. And we know what that's like. We know what it's like conjuring up relationships, conjuring up jobs, that you know, promotions and stuff that God didn't say. So God says, send that home. That's not for me. Now, when he sends the thing home that he created, they're mad and angry because he should have never brought them in in the first place. Now we go ahead and, and now they go fight and Amaziah and his troops go fight. And the Bible says that, that what the prophet said was true. God was with him. So he kills 10,000 Edomite troops. Then the Bible says another 10,000 he captured and then threw them over the top of the mountain and they broke into pieces. At, this is some crazy stuff. Uh, threw them over the mountain and uh, they broke into several pieces as they went down the mountain. Then it says in uh, verse uh, 13 that when the uh, when the king was coming back, those 3,000 people that he sent away, uh, they decided to raid uh, several villages and take several plunders. What am I saying? Just what I said at the beginning, which is that when we create stuff, we are responsible for what we create. But when God creates it in our lives, God is responsible for that in which he creates. He is responsible for that in which he puts in our lives. We see that in the text. He created this issue. He hired those 100,000 people before ever consulting God. God comes and says, that's not my will. Now all of a sudden he sends the people away. Those people are angry. Why? Because it was something he conjured up. And then they decide to plunder towns and kill 3,000 people. 3,000 people died because he did it his way. Even though in the end, he got in line with what God was saying, 3,000 people died because he started doing things with his own hands. What am I saying to you this morning? You are responsible when you start doing things your way and others will be affected by your decisions. And that's why it's important that you're not wilding out just trying to do your own thing. That's why it's important you're not just taking jobs and promotions just for money. That's why it's important you're not moving just because best friend move. That's why it's important you're not just doing it. Why? Because the father has created you and there's something specific that he has for you to do. And that may not be in line with everyone else. He created them to do something different. And so that's why it's important that we're not doing things our way. Why? Because now 3000 people have died and plunder and plunder has been taken. That's good has been taken all because Amaziah did it his way. And then in the end, he fired the 100,000, but they were already mad. And now what's coming is, is from what he did from the beginning. Point number three is you are responsible for what you create. 
When God is not involved, whether that's good or bad, you are responsible. You need to invite God in with whatever you got going on, and then God can show you his way. I always feel like um, if you've ever taken a test, I'm going to use this as a natural example. You guys know I like analogies. So if you've ever taken a test and they're like, man, you got an open book test. Those were the best tests to take in school. Why? You didn't even have to study. You could just show up, open the book up, and those tests I would ace. I would be done in like 15 minutes because I would be like, it's open book. Cool. I didn't have to study. It was those tests you had to study for hours to come in and only get an 85 or 70 because it was like you had to retain all the knowledge. Believers, we are taking an open book test. Here is your book. Open it up and, and learn the will of the Father. You can easily go and talk to him. This is not a closed book test. God is not expecting you to be perfect. He is not expecting you to have it all together. But what he is expecting is that you invite him in and don't try to just do everything yourself. I don't know why we wait. And then when the pressure is on thick, then we decide to invite God in. No, invite God in the beginning, and then you don't have to wait when it's hard to be like, ooh, God, I need you. No, invite him in in the beginning. If you're consistently asking it, him for his wisdom, for his direction, then you don't have to wait until the end to invite him in. Let's keep going. Verse 14, it says, when King Amaziah returned from slaughtering the Emonimites, he brought with himself idols. Uh, taken from the people of Seir. He set them up and offered sacrifices to them. This made the Lord very angry. And he sent a prophet. Now here's a second prophet coming to ask, why do you turn gods, uh, turn to gods who could not even save their own people from you? Verse 16, here's Amaziah. Here's the real Amaziah kicking in. Remember the Bible said in verse two that he was not loyal with his heart that he was not serving God wholeheartedly. Here it is in verse 16. But the king interrupted the prophet. He didn't even let the prophet get out what he was trying to say. And said, since when have I made you the king's counselor? Be quiet before I have you killed. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Here Amaziah is, and see, that's what happens. I want you to see the progression. Amaziah now uh, decides that, you know what? I think I want to bring some of these little gods back, these little false idols, and uh, I'm going to set them up, and I'm going to start worshiping them. When he's in the midst of doing things now his way for the second time, uh, the prophet, because God loves him so much. I want you to see this in the text. God loves Amaziah so much, he don't just strike him dead. God could have just snapped his finger and kills him, but he loves him. So he sends a prophet and, and, and tries to bring a word of correction, a, a word of getting him in line, uh, like some bumper, uh, the bumper lanes at, at, at the bowling alley. He's trying to get that ball back on the right course. And the prophet begins to say, hey, why do you turn to God's? Uh, when they couldn't even save their own people. Before he could even say the next word, the Bible says, and it's not funny, it's really sad, Amaziah stops him and says, who are you? Basically, he was boasting in himself as king. You don't counsel me as king. Your little peon, go on about your business, is, is what he was saying. Now to the prophet who is speaking on behalf of God, this man is stubborn and he's in pride and he's like, look, you don't talk to me. You don't tell me what to do. That is a dangerous thing when God loves you and he loves you so much that he sends a word of correction, a word to get you in alignment. He sends them bumper lanes so that your ball not going in the gutter. He's trying to keep you straight. It's a dangerous thing when you're like, I don't even want to hear it. Going about your business. I just want to do me. And let me say this in the world today. There are many people where God is drawing and they like, nah, you know what? I just want to do me. I don't want to hear all that Jesus stuff. Um, it's a dangerous thing when God loves you and he's summoning you and you're rejecting the summoning of the king. It's the same thing in our lives practically. It's when God is saying, hey, I really don't want you to date that person. Hey, no, that's not your wife. Hey, I don't want you to uh, uh, go and spend $500 on shoes. Hey, I don't want you to do that. I want you to save a little bit. You're getting older. I want you to start having a savings. I want you to pass some stuff down to your kids. I don't want you to just live check to check. Um, it's a dangerous thing when God trying to get you to be disciplined and you're like, you know what? 
My kids can fend for themselves. I spend money the way I want to. I'm gonna live, I'm gonna do my own thing. That's a dangerous thing. Why? Because the love of the Father is summoning you and you're rejecting him. It's a dangerous thing to do that because he loves you. He's summoning. It is not you that should be rejecting. You should be hearing the Father's heart. And okay, I'm gonna do it. Because obviously, I say this all the time to people I mentor. He knows the end from the beginning. So if he's already telling you to save, then he already knows what where he's trying to take you. Uh, maybe he want to give you a million dollars down the line, but he's not finna give you that if you can't handle $10,000 or $5,000 or $2,000. And so he's trying to get you to save because he knows the end from the beginning. He knows where he's trying to take you. And so I'm saying when the king is summoning you and he's giving you instructions, we shouldn't reject the summoning of the king. And I'm not talking about physical king. I'm talking about the father, king, king Jesus. I'm talking about him. And so again, he rejects the prophet and it's like, look, bro, I ain't trying to hear what you got to say. I'm going to do me. And, and who are you to try to counsel? Um, I've heard people say this, like, I am so-and-so. Uh, I don't take advice from so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, the danger in that is you're not so-and-so without Christ. And so the danger in thinking you all that, and I don't take advice from the little peons, um, uh, that's dangerous because you wouldn't be who you are without Christ. When you start setting yourself up to think you're all that and you don't need Jesus anymore, you're putting yourself in a place of failure because without him, you are going to fail. And I don't care if you say, well, there are billionaires who live without Jesus right, but the end result is hell. If they don't accept him as Lord and Savior, who cares that they had a billion dollars? If they don't accept him as Lord and Savior, you still fail because the end result is that billion dollars ain't going to hell with you. If you do not accept him as Lord and Savior, that is not going with you. So I would say that if you do not have Jesus, the end result is failure. And when you don't invite him in, you start being responsible for every decision that you start making. All right. No, point number four is when we know that we have messed up, uh, we have to face it and not run from it. The easiest thing for Amaziah to do in the text was to repent and say, you know what? <laughs> I was kind of feeling myself when I was bringing them idols back. You're right. Since God didn't came and sent this prophet, let me just go on and confess that I messed up. He should have did that. That would have been the easiest thing. When I was younger in my 20s, I was probably very similar to Amaziah, not rejecting God in that sense, but very hard-headed and very stubborn. The closer I'm getting to 40, <laughs> I don't have that kind of time to be like, I'm going to run into the wall 500 times. When God brings word of correction, I'm like, you know what? I shouldn't have did that. I'm sorry. Let me get that right. Why? Because the older you get, you, you don't have the time you had like when you were 19, just bullheaded, making bad decisions, getting in bad relationships, taking bad jobs. You don't have that type of time the older you get. Why? Because it's like you, your recovery time is different. And I could go into that, but your recovery time is different. Uh, and I'll give you a natural example. When you were in your 1920s, man, I would scrape my leg listen, within five minutes, I was good. I was running. I was playing basketball again. Now that I'm 37 <laughs> and I'm not even that old, but now when I scrape my leg, it seems like it takes forever for that leg to heal. I wake up the next morning. It still hasn't all the way scabbed over. Why? Because your recovery time is different the older you get. That's why we should make better choices the older we get. Maturity should set in the older you're getting. You shouldn't still be doing the same thing you was messing up in in your 20s and your 40s. Consistency should kick in somewhere. All right. People don't like that. Let me keep going. Uh, verses 17, and it says, after consulting with his advisors, so now he don't listen to the prophet, so he gonna go get him some advice. You don't need no advisors. Your advisors was Christ. You just rejected that whole thing. All right, he went to get his advisor. King Amaziah of Judah sent this challenge to Israel's king, Joash. Uh, now he feeling himself. I want y'all to see this. He feeling himself. The son of Joash, the grandson of Jehu, come and meet me in battle. But King Joash of Israel replied to King Amaziah of Judah uh, with this story. Out in the Lebanon mountains, a thistle sent a message to a mighty cedar tree. Give your daughter in marriage to my son. But just then a wild animal of Lebanon came by and stepped on the thistle, crushing it. Uh, verse 19. Am I going? Yeah, 19. You are saying I've defeated Edom and you are very proud of it. But my advice to you is stay home. 
Why stir up trouble that will only bring disaster on you and the people of Judah? I'm laughing because this reminds me of when I was little. You know, when you were younger, you would be like, hey, here's the line, cross that line. And if you cross that line, it's gonna go down. Long as you stay on the other side of that line, nothing's gonna happen. But when you cross this line, we gonna fight. That's what's happening in the text. Same, same scenario. Uh, King Amaziah is starting to feel himself. You know, he didn't want his battle with the Edomites, but we know he only won the battle because God said he was going to win the battle. He didn't want to battle with the Edomites. And one small little thing he forgot, just a little tiny thing he forgot, God said that he was going to destroy him. Well, it's, yeah, God said that he was going to destroy him by way of the prophet. And so uh, one small little thing he forgot is that, bro, God is not right there with you anymore. So you you beating on your chest like, hey, you, you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and battle with you. But a little small detail is when you did the first fight, God was with you. Uh, little small detail, just a little small detail, is this time when you fight, bro, you're going in this battle by yourself because the Bible already says, the prophet said that God was going to destroy him. And so just a small detail that, that he, he forgot. And so... He's challenging this king, and uh, the king is like, bro, uh, <laughs> you didn't want one little war, one little war, go on over there and leave me alone. And we know what that's like, because if you've ever been a fighter, I tell you all this, I was a fighter when I was younger. And so if you've ever been a fighter, you know you come up against somebody, and they're like, bro, just go, sis, just go on over there and leave me alone. You're not ready for what's over here. Just go on over there. And so that's what's happening in the text is, is, is the king of Israel is like, bro, go on over there and leave me alone. But we're going to see this king is feeling himself. Uh, verse 20. Yeah, I don't have any. Uh, oh, okay. I put a note in this one. Consistent instability is a sign that you are not submitted to God's will. Consistent, this point number five, consistent instability is a sign that you are not submitted to God's will. Uh, that's all in the text. So again, he was fine at the beginning. Then he wanted to do his own thing. So he wanted to do his own thing. Then the, the, uh, then the prophet comes and like, bro, that's not God. Get rid of them higher troops. Um, then he brings the idols in. Uh, uh, well, let me s s jump up. He goes to fight the war. Uh, he wins against the Edomites. So that's, he's up. Then he goes back down. He brings the idols back and decides to worship. So uh, he's back down. And then the prophet comes to warn him. And then he goes down further. Uh, we see King Amaziah is like this. Whew. So instability there. Consistent instability is a number one sign you are not submitted to the will of God. We see that with King Amaziah. If he would have been fully wholeheartedly submitted to the will of God, there wouldn't have been a lot of instability there. I said consistent instability because the Bible in verse two already told us that his heart was not all the way submitted. He was not loyal to God. He was not wholeheartedly submitting to God. So I'm saying to you is that when you start seeing consistent instability, then you got to go back and, and check. Are you really submitted to the will of God? The other thing I find funny in this text is I think King Amaziah was really starting to feel himself. His little head was starting to get big. Why? Because the reason to me, it's in the text why he chose to go fight Israel and not go fight anyone else. One, one in verse uh, seven, it says, do not hire the troops from Israel for the Lord is not with Israel. So that may have just been something he was thinking about. Like God's not with Israel. I could easily beat Israel. I think the thing he forgot is that God wasn't with you either. So going to fight them and God wasn't with you either. That wasn't going to be no easy fight. The other thing I want to say is in verse uh, 10, it says the higher troops, those were from Israel. He sent them back and they were very angry. And then in verse uh, 13, it talks about how they killed 3000 people and carried off great plunders. So what I feel like is one, he was thinking about what well, God's not with Israel. Two, he was mad that, that he hired these people. Then God made him send them back. And then the people were angry from Israel and they killed 3,000 of his people and they carried off plunder. So I feel like he's picking a fight because he feels like it's an easy fight to pick and I can destroy these people and it's not going to be a big deal. We have to be very careful again, doing it our way because he thinks that this is going to be a super easy fight and he's going to be in a, a bit of a shock on what's going to happen. All right. 
I'm out of here. Last eight verses, and I'm going to give one point, and I'm gone. But Amaziah refused to listen, for God was determined to destroy him for returning to the gods of Edom. So King Joash of Israel mobilized his army against King Amaziah of Judah. The two armies drew up their battle lines. Remember I told you the little lines? Cross that line. All right. And Judah was routed by the army of Israel, and its army scattered and fled home. Then King Joash of Israel captured Judah's king, Amaziah, son of Joash. Then he brought him to Israel, where he uh, brought him to Jerusalem, where he demolished 600 feet of Jerusalem's wall from the gate, uh, from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate. He carried off all the gold and silver. He carried off the articles of the temple, uh, and he seized the treasures of the royal place. He also took some hostages. Look at all of this stuff that's happening right now, because he decided to go challenge this man to a fight. All right, then King Amaziah of Judah lived 15 years after the death of King Joash. The rest of the events of Amaziah's reign are recorded in the book of the kings of Judah. After Amaziah turned away from the Lord, there was a conspiracy against his life in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But his enemies sent assassins after him, and they killed him there. And they brought his back body back on a horse, and he was buried in the city of David. Um, all right, so I want to end on this. Number six, our decisions and choices not only affect us, but they affect those around us. Our decisions of choices not only affect us, but they affect everyone around us. Everyone in your inner circle, all of your family is affected by your choices. How do I know this? It's in the text. He decided that he wanted to hire these 100,000 troops without seeking the father. The prophet comes says, no, don't do that. 3,000 people died just because he decided to do that. And some of their plunder was taken. The other thing is here in uh, verses 20 through 24, as it says that his decision to now challenge this king of, 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 of Israel, this is what happened. One, it, it, uh, Jerusalem's wall, 600 feet of their wall was destroyed. Two, gold and silver was taken. Three, articles was taken from the temple. Four, treasures of the royal palace was taken. Five, hostages was taken. And number six, it cost him his life. All because, again, he decided to now challenge this king and, 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 and reject what the wisdom that God was giving him, reject the correction that God was given. And now it not only affected him, the whole town was affected by his decision. Our decisions and choices not only affect us, but they affect us, or, or those that are around us. I want to end with this statement, and I want you guys to think about this as you go through your week. One of the things that kept standing out to me in King Amaziah is that he was one choice away one decision away from repenting and getting it right with God. See, many people would have counted him out like, oh, he rejected the prophet. Uh, oh, he did this, that, and that. But at any moment, he could have repented. He was one decision away. And who are we to say, oh, if he repented, God wouldn't have forgiven him. How do we know that? How do we know that? You can't say that off the text. He was one decision away from repenting and he could have turned and, 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 and turn back to God. One decision away. We know that because at the beginning, when the first prophet came, he told him he shouldn't have hired him and to get rid of him. One decision. He decides, okay, I'm going to get rid of him. He was one decision away from just inviting God in. He was one decision away from just turning back to the Father. But instead, he just kept doing it his own way. What am I saying to you this morning is we are always one decision away from inviting the Father in. We are one decision away. And I'm not saying you're I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just talking about in your everyday walk. We are one decision away from inviting God in. But also the opposite is true. We're one decision away from doing it our way. I want to challenge you this morning is as you go through this week, man, don't just do it your automatic way. Don't just do it the way you're like, I just always do things this way. Well, maybe that's not God's way. Maybe you should stop and just be like, God, is this the way you want me to do it? Don't be like, I'm, I'm going to start a business. I'm just going to do it because my daddy had a business and my daddy's daddy had a business. Maybe God don't want you to have a business. So don't just do it your automatic way. I want to put a challenge out there to do it God's way. It's to invite the father in and say, God, what's your will? Don't just date the same girl, the same boy, the same man, the same woman. Don't just do it. If you're not married, I want to challenge you to date who God says. And, and, and maybe they're not 25, 36, 24, whatever the figures are. But, but if God is saying that's the one, that's who you want to be with. 
if you're married, I want to challenge you to love your wife and husband the way God does. I don't want you to do it the way your daddy did it and your mama did it. I want to challenge you to do it God's way. And don't just be stubborn and be like, she just got to accept me because this is the way I am. Well, maybe that's not the way God wants you to be. Maybe that's the way you are, but that's not the way God wants you to be. So I want to put a challenge out there this morning on this video is let's, let's do it God's way. Let's invite him in. Don't just automatically be, I've always had an attitude. My mama had an attitude. My mama's mama had an attitude. My mama's 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 mama had an attitude. And a whole family is full of women with attitudes. Well, baby, maybe God don't want you to have an attitude. Maybe you want to break that thing starting with you. So it's like, don't just be like, uh, uh, my daddy didn't leave nothing for me, so I ain't going to leave nothing for my kids. No, maybe God wants you to leave an inheritance for your kids. Maybe he wants you to leave some legacy for your kids. And maybe your daddy didn't get it right, but you could get it right. So I want to put a challenge out there because I challenged myself when I was studying this is God, not in everything in my life have I invited you in. Not in everything in my life have I sought you to do it your way. But I want to start putting that as a practice that I want to do it your way and I want to invite you in. Uh, and just because my mama did it one way, just because my daddy did it one way, that doesn't mean that's your way for me. And so I want to be who you're calling me to be. And I want to do what it is that you're calling Angela McGill to do. And I want you, those that are watching this, to be challenged to do it God's way and not do it your way. Um, and again, I feel uh, what we saw in the text is when we do it God's way, God jumps in and he covers us. His hand is greater than our hand. His ways are greater. Uh, uh, the scripture says it's higher than our ways. And so I want to challenge you in that aspect. Let's pray. Father, thank you for just being amazing, God. Thank you for being wonderful. Thank you for being great. Man, thank you for your word, God. You said your word won't return to your void. But everything that you sent it to do, it will accomplish that in which you sent it to do. And so, Father, today we thank you for your word. We thank you for being able to break bread together, Father. I pray that the words that uh, we uh, that I taught on today and we read about that it would not fall to, to fallow ground, God, hardened soil. But may we be open to receive the word um, that you spoke this morning. Father, may we not do it our own way, but may we invite you in on everything. May we seek your will. Father, may we not compare our lives to so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, but let the standard be you. And so it's not easy just to get out for and saying, well, I'm not like so-and-so. I'm not doing it like so-and-so. But let the standard of our lives be you, Father. And that way it challenges us to be more like you. Father, this morning, I pray for everyone that will watch this video. I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray that you would cover them this week in the blood of Jesus. I pray that the peace that passes all understanding will guard their hearts and minds. I pray that their ears would be open to hear your voice and what it is that you're saying for their lives, God. May they not just be like their daddy and their mama and their daddy's daddy and grandmother, but may they be who you're calling them to be. May generational curses be broken, Father. May, may word things, word curses be uprooted. May they be who you've said for them to be, Father. And if that's going to be a challenge, we thank you that we have Holy Spirit, that, that he can help us to be more like you, Father. And um, I love Hebrews, God, where you said that you know, you know there's nothing that we go through that you don't bear witness to. You know the infirmities. You know what we deal with. Um, you are our greatest witness. And so, Father, I thank you for that this morning. Pray for my brother Marcus as he's going to do his video tomorrow morning. May you be with him, Father. May you strengthen him. May the joy of the Lord be his strength. May you give him peace of mind, Father. And may you speak through him as he is going to speak on tomorrow. May you lead and guide him in the word. May he say only what you want him to say and uh, nothing else. And, Father, I just thank you for that this morning. Cover my boy. Be, be with him as he speaks on Thursday. And uh, thank you for Aaron and the rest of this squad, God, that we would just be who you're calling us to be. And I give you the glory and praise. You guys have a great day. Peace.